And I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that everything that has happened to me here has helped to spread the good news. For everyone here, including the whole palace guard, knows that I am in chains because of Christ. And because of my imprisonment, most of the believers here have gained confidence and boldly speak God's message without fear. This is the word of the Lord. It's not the magnitude of your gift that matters. It's the depth of your love that matters. And God can take a small act and change the world, as the song said. Nothing you do every day is insignificant. If God is working his will in your life, However big it may seem, however small it may seem. Just a little rock can make a giant fall. Pray with me. Father, you call us to live for you each day. And then the way we live our lives and our faithfulness to our daily activities. You work to bring down giants. You work through the most insignificant seeming actions to change the world. So may we never forget that you're at work in the mundane routine of our dailiness. Let us offer it all to you that you might do that work which we cannot dream or conceive. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a thousand times. You have too. The grass is always greener. The grass is always greener on the other side. It's a way of saying, if things weren't what they are, they'd be different. <laughs> it's a way of saying, if things weren't what they are, I would be different. As a pastor, I often would approach people about serving in some capacity and hear them say something like this. Well, pastor, I, I really believe we need to be doing that. I think it's a great idea and a great ministry. But right now, I, my circumstances just don't permit me to be a part of it. Now, I will. Somewhere down the line, I'll get on board. But right now, I just, well, I, I just can't. The grass is always greener on the other side. We're always looking for that greener grass. Americans spend a lot of their time dreaming about another time, another place, another set of circumstances where we can really be who we are called to be. But the fact is, for most of us, things are not going to change all that much. If anybody had a right to be dreaming about the greener grass, it was the Apostle Paul when he wrote the letter to the Philippian church. When Paul wrote this letter, he had been in prison for four years. 48 months. 1,460 days. That's a long time. And Paul lived his life to be on the road, didn't he? That's where his life with Christ began, on the road to Damascus. And the rest of his life he spent on the road. That song by Johnny Cash, On the Road Again, perfect theme song for the Apostle Paul. So how must he have felt, having been confined to one locale, chained to a Roman soldier for four long years, 48 months, 
1,460 days. I know how I would have felt. I know what I would have been doing. I would have been cowering over the corner, whining. Why me, God? Have I not tried to do your will? Why have you let this happen to me? The Philippians were afraid that's what Paul was doing. They were afraid that this uh, confinement for so long was wreaking havoc with Paul's mental state. And so they sent him a gift with a man named Epaphroditus, and they sent him this letter. So how did Paul respond to his imprisonment? Well, that's what he tells us in Philippians 1, beginning in verse 12. I want you to know, beloved, that what has happened to me has actually helped to spread the gospel. Whoa! You're in jail. You've been in jail for four years. How does that help spread the gospel? Well, he goes on to tell us. So that it has become known throughout the whole imperial guard and to everyone else that my imprisonment is for Christ. Now, the imperial guard were a special elite force. They were something like the uh, secret service. They guarded the emperor in Rome, but they went everywhere there were Roman governmental officials to guard them, wherever they were, which meant they were all the way from Great Britain, down through Northern Africa, through Asia Minor, Palestine, Praetorian Guard, Imperial Guard, they were everywhere. And for four years, Paul had been chained to one of these members of the Imperial Guard. Now, not all the time, any one of them, they shifted and changed and shifted and changed. But you know, I wonder what Paul talked to them about. He kind of had a captive audience, didn't he? They had to stay there, chained to him. So I think he talked to them about Jesus, don't you? And I think that many of them were won to Christ by Paul's ministry of faithfulness in that Roman jail. Paul came to understand that um, that jail cell was a mission-sending location. Because as these imperial guard were transferred all over the Roman Empire, they took with them their newfound faith in Jesus. So if you and I could get in the time machine, and go back 2,000 years and find ourselves in Great Britain, we might find a, a little nucleus of a church started by one of the Praetorian Guard, won to Christ by Paul in his prison cell. Or go down to Gaul. Gaul is what we call France today. We might find another little church planted by Paul, planted by Praetorian Guard, Imperial Guard, won to Christ by Paul in his prison cell. Or to North Africa, or to Asia Minor, or wherever the Romans were. I just believe God used Paul's imprisonment to spread the gospel to places that Paul himself could never have gone in all of his days. His ministry was being multiplied time over time over time. I want you to understand, beloved, What's happened to me has really served to spread the gospel. It seemed like the most impossible of circumstances, the most unlikely place for the gospel to be spread in a prison cell. Yet Paul understood that from that prison cell, the good news of Jesus Christ was being sent around the world. He didn't have the luxury that we have today of television ministry. 
he probably couldn't have gotten on anyway, the descriptions we have of him would not make him a candidate for TV ministry. He didn't have the internet. All he had were those Praetorian Imperial Guards that were with him day and night, day and night, day and night. And from them, the gospel was spread in a way Paul could never have imagined. Paul was learning that there is no insignificant place in the ministry of the kingdom because there are no insignificant people in the heart of the king. No insignificant places of ministry in the work of the kingdom because there are no insignificant people in the heart of the king. So whatever your place may be, it is significant. Whatever your role may be, it is significant. You may say, well, it's, how can it be significant? I mean, I'm never on the platform, never get to preach. Every place of service in the ministry of the kingdom is significant, even if it's a prison cell where you've been confined for four long years. William Lee Steep Moon. That name ring a bell for anybody? William Lee Steep Moon, a Native American who taught English at the University of Missouri in Columbia. He was laid off because there were state cutbacks. Many of his colleagues were laid off, the junior faculty. So he decided one day to get his old VW bus. How many of you remember VW buses? The uh, forerunner of the van. And he sort of outfitted it so he could live in it. This is before they had these kind of play things. And he got his dog, and he and his dog set out on a journey across America. He writes about that amazing adventure in a book called Blue Highways, one of my all-time favorite reads, Blue Highways. At one point in his journey, he comes to a little town in Texas called Dime Box. Anybody know where Dime Box, Texas is? All right. Usually none, but at least we have one. He drove into Dime Box one day and he noticed that the local cafe seemed to have a lot of cars in front of it, so he thought, well, I'll just stop and have lunch. So he pulled his car up, got out, walked down the sidewalk into the dime box cafe. And he was amazed because the whole cafe was filled with people. And the conversation was going a mile a minute. He couldn't find a place to sit except up the counter at one of those stools that revolves. Remember those? So he took his seat. He placed his order, and then he just listened. And he couldn't believe what he was hearing. Now, this is not Dallas. This is not Houston. This is not San Antonio. This is Dime Box, Texas, population 200. And they're, they're discussing things like the war in Vietnam. This was back during the 60s, late 60s. They're discussing things like busing. Some of you will remember busing, an attempt to integrate our schools by busing people around to different schools in the city. And he was just amazed. He said, if I'd been in Dallas, I could understand that, but they don't have a bus in Dime Box. They don't have a school in Dime Box. So he listens. And then there comes a lull in the conversation. 
and he's swiveled the stool around where he's looking over everybody. And they all kind of turn toward him. I mean, he's the, the stranger among them. After a moment, one of the old timers in Dimebox says this. City folk don't think much of importance happens in a place like Dimebox. Now suppose it doesn't unless you consider conflict important. Are babies being born important? Are people dying important? Or love important? I had to put the book down. God used that old timer in dime box to speak to my life and turn my plan upside down. Down. Here was my plan. I surrendered to the ministry when I was 15 years old. I would go to seminary, go to college, go to seminary. Then I would pastor a small rural church for a couple of years. Then I'd move to a suburban church in town for a couple more years. Then I'd move to First Church County Seat town for a couple of years. And finally, I'd end up at the First Baptist Church of Atlanta. Georgia, where I grew up. I mean, that was a trajectory. But that old time made me understand that there's no place too small that conflict is not happening. There's no place too small that babies are not being born, that people are dying. There's no place too small for love to be happening. And that's where the church must be. That's where the church must be. There are no insignificant people and places of service in the work of the kingdom. Because there are no insignificant people in the life and the heart of the king. That means whatever your role is in Second Baptist Church, it is absolutely significant to the work of the kingdom. From the highest to the lowest from the most visible to the least visible, no matter what your role may be, it is significant to the work of the kingdom because the people you're working with and for are significant in the heart of the king. You may be rocking babies in the nursery. Significant ministry. You may be teaching young people significant ministry. You may be keeping the records in a class significant ministry. You may be sitting on a committee, that's significant ministry. You may be in the choir, that's significant ministry. You may be picking people up to bring them to the church, that's significant ministry. Whatever your ministry, there are no insignificant ministries in the work of the kingdom because there are no insignificant people in the life and the heart of the king. And you never know what that one little thing you seem to be doing, what God will do with it. You never really know. One example. A young African growing up in the slums of Soweto in South Africa is walking down the street with his mother one day and along comes a man toward them, a white man. 
Now, this was absolutely incredible. Uh, white people didn't come into the slums of Soweto. This man got closer, and he recognized that he had a clerical collar on. And so he and his mother decided to move out of the way so that he could go by. But when they moved out of the way, he turned toward them and walked toward them. And as he got right beside them, he tipped his hat to them. Desmond Tutu never forgot the tip of that hat. When he accepted the Nobel Peace Prize, the person who introduced him told the story because Tutu had told him that it was that simple act, a white man tipping his hat, that made him turn to the church. He sought that man out. He became his mentor. He prepared for his education. He enabled him to travel to university and to seminary. All because one day, in what would seem most insignificant, he tipped his hat and changed the world. Few people in the last hundred years have had more impact on the world as a whole than Desmond Tutu. It all began with the tip of a hat. Whatever you're doing. Is liable to change the world. A new year begins now for us. Today we pray for our Sunday school leaders and teachers, our MLK tutors, all the people who are assuming roles in the life of our church. Every one of you, I want you to understand that what you will be doing this year is absolutely essential to the kingdom work of this church. All of you in school this year will be praying for you. I want you to understand that living your life faithfully for Jesus every day can change the world. You may never know it, but God will use you in ways you cannot dream or conceive. I don't know about you, but this, this is exciting to me. God is ready to use everything we do to accomplish his dream for the salvation of every man, woman, boy, girl, all creation. So we're going to pray now for all those who will be working in various capacities. We're going to move around the sanctuary and Jeff is going to come give directions to you. But you remember that you're praying for people who by their faithful action will be changing the world. Thanks be to God. To God be the glory. A little pebble can knock a giant down. 